Best team ever. Welcome. Thank you all for joining this panel that we are hosting here today. I am thrilled to be able to be the moderator for today's panel. Um, now more than ever, um, I think it's critical to be talking about what we'll be talking about today. And the topic really is women in the workplace and diversity in the workplace. Why is it important? You know, how, what can we do about it and how we as women living in this situation and having various levels of experience, what we've seen and how we want to get involved directly in it. I hope you find that the panel is interesting, informative and ultimately inspiring. So with that, um, I wanted to um, start off by saying that um, if you look at women in the workplace at every level from uh, beginning uh, entry level all the way through to boards, women are grossly underrepresented and women of, of color are even more underrepresented. Over the last five years, studies have said that marginal amount of progress has been made. It's very slow, but steady. Unfortunately, some are predicting that due to the pandemic that we could be taking a giant leap backward. So our goal is let's not let that happen. So with that, we're gonna do introductions. Uh, first of all, I am Cheryl Ann Moore. I'm Executive Vice President and Chief Marketing Officer for Bloom Energy. I've spent over 25 years in energy and technology. I love products and technology. I love customers and people, and I love to win, very competitive. Um, what I'm gonna ask is each of our esteemed panelists to do the same thing, introduce who they are, uh, maybe a passion or interest, and something you might not know about them, reading their biography. For me, you might not know, I'm actually legally blind or almost legally blind. I use really amazing contact lenses to do distance vision. And I'm using these readers now for my short distance vision because I'm in my 40s. So with that, um, I'd like to turn first to the Honorable Mary Bush. Mary, would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you, Sherilyn. Um, well, first, I have the great honor of uh, serving on the board of directors of Bloom Energy and uh, chair the audit committee. Uh, I'm on several other uh, corporate boards, including uh, Discover Financial Services, Mantech International, um, just re re resigned or left the board of Marriott International, where I was for about 10 years, and I'm on the board of T. Rowe Price. I've been on several others over my career. I've spent um, most of my career in the financial world, whether it was private sector or government, uh, corporate finance, uh, and international finance, enjoyed it thoroughly. And I love to sing. I study uh, with an opera uh, teacher, coach, but I sing a little bit of everything from oratorio to um, American musical theater. And I love to dance. And, um, and, uh, I, and, and to dance, I, I mean to, you know, the oldies but goodies, rock and roll and popular music. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Mary, I love that. Thank you for taking time to be with us today. Next, I'll go to you, Susan. Hi, Sherilyn, and welcome, everyone. And you can read, you know, much about me on LinkedIn or, or Facebook and uh, a Twitter. I have a, a pretty public profile. I've been in industry over 30 years. Um, what some people don't know about me is my undergraduates and microbiology, which is now molecular and cellular biology, and I built cars and trucks, and now I build energy servers. So um, my, my fundamental um, thinking, how I, how I do business, how I do, how I do work is, is based on a scientific and biological method. So uh, that's something that people may not see um, when they look me up. Uh, a couple other um, pieces of, of, of uh, information is similar to Mary, clearly I don't sing but I love music. I love live music. 
And I am really looking forward to live venues coming back. I am a, a blues aficionado. I love the particularly blues from the early 20th century. Um, and I've seen Buddy Guy three times before all this happened in, in a year or so. Um, and I hope someday to move to Tanzania and uh, work on the conservation of elephants. So thank you for inviting me to the panel. And, you know, I look forward to the discussion today. Thank you, Susan. And I learned something new about you. That's incredible. Well, to our next member of our panel, um, excited to have you here, Perry. Say a little bit about yourself. Sure. Thank you so much. I just want to say thanks for including me in this panel. I'm really thrilled to be a part of such an amazing panel of women, and I'm excited about today's discussion. Um, I'm a staff engineer here at Bloom. I'm closing in on about four years. Before working at Bloom, I got my PhD at Dartmouth College in inorganic chemistry, and then before that, I was in college at Bard College, uh, also getting a Bachelor of Arts in chemistry. Um, for me, it's been really important to be in a sports role. So growing up both in high school and in college, I was the captain of our soccer team and our track and field team. And I think that that's something I've carried throughout my life is being really passionate in sports, specifically in women's sports. And something you might not know about me is I'm really passionate about woodworking. So I made my own chairs uh, a couple months ago and they now sit on our patio. Oh my goodness. Oh, the talent. Well, thank you again, um, all three of you for being on the panel. You know, this topic um, has, uh, I think, you know, a, a very uh, important part of each one of us. You know, I think that's why we're dedicating our time here today. Um, I'd open by telling a bit of uh, my story. I had my moment where I realized the importance of this topic and getting involved. Um, when I first had the opportunity to go into the executive ranks given my vice president title. Um, the CEO at the time uh, offered me an opportunity to go into an executive women's course for a year at Northwestern University in their Kellogg School of Management. I said, yes, I was thrilled. But deep down I thought, well, this for me is more about executive education because the fact that I'm a woman, it really doesn't have much to do with you know, me or my career, I'm me and I do what I do and I don't let issues about being a woman get in my way. And so the first day of that program, uh, they had, um, it was very data driven, they brought in and they started talking about the differences between men and women from a scientific point of view. You'd love this, Susan. And the studies proved that time and time again, there were certain intrinsic qualities that science says that we do differently as women. And some of these differences are things that can hold us back. Um, women are far less likely to apply for any job unless we meet every one of the uh, requisite experiences and, uh, and, and asks for requirements. Um, we as women uh, oftentimes don't use the network uh, that's, that's around us to shortchange. We think we need to work hard. Uh, and, and not take those shortcuts, just to name a few of uh, the differences. And I've been fascinated by that because as they went through, and there were many more, I thought, oh, I do that, I do that because I'm a woman. So um, it was a, a fascinating experience. And ever since then, I recognized that not only as a leader in a company do I have an obligation to mentor and advise others, I recognize that as a woman and with other women, I could play a really important role. So with that, um, as we talked about, women are underrepresented, women of color underrepresented in the workplace. And why does it matter? I think we've all heard the benefits, but time and time again, employee engagement's enriched, innovation uh, is, is secured, uh, financials um, can be up to 2x, 50%, not 2x, excuse me, 50% uh, greater, and market share is greater by having a greater amount of diversity. So it matters, and it matters to our business's bottom line. And it just makes for a better place to work in my mind. So with that, that's why, that's why we matter, that's why it cares. So let's go ahead and um, get going with some of our questions. So first, um, just to um, maybe ask each of you, um, we've all had an opportunity in the workplace to either be a mentor or to really have a role model that's made a difference. And sometimes being the role model can be as impactful as having one. 
So I'd like to ask each of you, maybe I'll start with Terry. Um, tell us a little bit about having a role model or someone to look up to as you're getting started. Sure, yeah. So I think having a role model from as early as middle school, high school, as you're growing up is really important. What that looks like personally for your personal development to go into higher education. Um, I think that sports is a huge impact for giving women the courage to move forward and continue their studies. I think it gives you a confidence that you might not otherwise have. So when I was in high school, I think looking up to some of our track coaches, um, we had Coach Werfel was one of our track coaches. She was really important for me from a personal level. As I transitioned to a professional level, going through graduate school, and then eventually into the workplace, someone who I think I'm really looking up to right now is actually Susan, because as I entered Bloom, I met Susan probably the second day I had entered the company. She was very warm and inviting. She immediately offered to put me towards a women uh, in leadership. This is, you know, BWLI. This is a program that Bloom runs that's run by Susan. Uh, and I think she does a really good job of showing how you can walk the walk and talk the talk. I think that she's doing a great job and she should be really proud of how she makes younger women feel. Well, thank you, Carrie. Carrie, thank you. Well, I have to turn to you, Susan. How does that make you feel? First no, no it, it, it makes me feel good. And it's, um, it's one of the joys that I have in the workplace. So when I came into the workplace, there were very few female role models and most of my role models were men. So it's okay to, to have a role model that it isn't the same gender as you. Um, you know, and I, I picked the people that I knew would push me. And one of the things I did early on, you remember, I have to always do like the commercial before I talk about my career. Things were very different when I came into the workforce and when I went into a factory in, in the late eighties. Um, so I picked, what I had learned is that I picked the person that would probably be the hardest on me and the roughest on me because I would grow the fastest. I didn't want somebody to tell me what I already knew. I, want some, I wanted somebody to, to be really upfront and really, uh, really push me. And so I picked some people that, you know, people would be surprised by like, why are you, you know, why is you, why are you, you know, pick, I don't like the word mentor, but why are you picking that person to coach you? I like the word, I like the word coach better. Um, you know, cause I, cause I wanted to get better and, you know, it was, it, it was an, it was an interesting experience. So, um, as I, as I come through the workforce and, uh, and I'm, you know, I'm at that, I'm at, this is an intergenerational panel. I'm at that place, right. You know, I'm, I'm at the last third of my career. I really look back and want to make sure that all of the seeds that I have planted, at least some of them them sprout. And now I feel because I am at, the, at that, that place in my career that I accelerate um, the, the rooting, for lack of a better term, for, for people like Carrie and her, her constituents that are in, you know, the millennial Gen Z, um, even Gen X uh, generations. I, you know, I, I, I have been fortunate or unfortunate, depends on, on how you look at it, but um, you know, my dad died when I was five and my mom had not intended to go into the workforce and this was the late sixties, but she had a college degree. And so I spent a lot of time in my formative years kind of between five and 10 with a lot of single women um, in the mid, mid sixties. They were all my, my mom's teacher's friends and she couldn't get a babysitter. So we went, went everywhere they went, um, you know and Mary Tyler Moore and Maud and you know, and you know, the ERA, all this stuff was going on at that time. And I kind of ended up embedded in that world of these really, um, you know, these, <laughs> these women were really on the cutting edge of that piece of the, you know, the woman's movement. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of my mom's friend was a teacher and she had a Corvette Stingray, man. I thought, I thought she was it, you know? I mean, we loved Linda and we'd go to her house and have fondue parties and, you know, and, and when, when, you know, and they didn't have kids, so they would take my brother and I shopping so my mom could get a break, you know, and she would buy a peace sign necklace, you know, it was just, it was, it, it was just, an, you know, so there was an unfortunate reason that I was in that situation, but it's part of that situation. So between the culture and, and those women, you know, they, they helped 
frame it. And then one of the really, the things that was probably the most impactful. So my mom was raising a family on a teacher's salary and the, she found out that the men made more money. And we're talking about like 1969, 1970. So she went to her principal and asked for more money. And I came home from school, um, you know, latchkey kid, because my mom was a, a single mom way before it was anybody else. You know, there, there were no, there was no social structure. It wasn't a thing. And she was, was yeah, a she, yeah. And she was crying because she didn't get the raise because the principal said, well, those men are raising a family. Well, she was also raising a family. So it had a financial impact on us. My mom was legally paid less. I mean, it was, you know, there was no, no repercussion. Um, and, you know, and our family was socioeconomically disadvantaged because of that. So lots and lots of reasons why, why I do what I do, but I'm really, I find a lot of joy in, in, in hoping to leave behind a stronger foundation for the women that come after me, because the women who came before me really blazed a trail. Wow, incredible, Susan. Thank you for sharing that. And I do wanna thank you. And I've been with Bloom just over seven months and you've been an incredible friend and leader and mentor, and it really helped me. So thank you. You're welcome. Mary, I'd love to hear from you with a career spanning since the seventies. You know, who's inspired you and being a role model yourself, what can you share about that? Who has inspired me? Um, you know, when, when I was um, young in, in the business world, quite frankly, there were no other women uh, to look up to or to be role models. Um, the people who inspired me and who essentially um, were my role models, were my parents and my teachers uh, back when I was in elementary school and high school. And let me tell you why that was so important. I grew up in Birmingham, Alabama, um, uh, during the time when Jim Crow laws were still in effect. And, um, and I was growing up also during uh, the civil rights movement. Uh, the teachers, my parents, let me talk about them first, uh, both of them, my mother and my father, were intense about the importance of education. They were intense about the importance of excellent um, integrity and character. Uh, so they were my role models. My teachers, very much the same. Um, the schools were entirely segregated and all of our teachers, of course, were black, many of them women, but some men as well. And when you think about it at that point in time, um, the most lauded uh, professional role to which a black person uh, could aspire was to be a teacher. Uh, or a principal. There are, you know, a few doctors, a few lawyers, but to be a teacher uh, was really um, uh, the be all and the end all. Uh, they gave us everything they had. I mean, these were people who would have been captains of industry. They were that good. Um, and when you think about it also, uh, their generation simply did not have the opportunities that I have had and uh, that young people nowadays uh, certainly have. Um, and I, 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 several of them I've interviewed for, uh, for something that I've, I've been writing. And um, the common theme is we knew that we had to have you, the children, in a state of readiness because we knew that the world would change. We didn't know exactly when or how it would happen, but we had to give you the best education possible um, and the best of everything that, uh, that they had to offer. Oh, thank you. You know, I, I also, Mary, wanted to ask you um, over the course of seeing things evolve for women in the workplace, um, you've probably seen a lot of differences over the course of time when you reflect upon you know, those different stages of your career as, as well as different companies, you know, how have you seen this evolution? Share, share some with us. 
Well, it's uh, it's been quite an evolution. Um, that evolution is is ongoing. Uh, let me take um, boards first of all. Um, I went on my first board. Um, I think it was the late eighties, and there were very very few women on boards at the time. I was still quite young. I was delighted uh, to have been identified and and selected. Um, uh, in nineteen ninety seven. Uh, I joined a board. It was the Pioneer Mutual Funds in Boston. They already had two women and I was the third woman. Now in 1997, that was unheard of to have three women on a board. Even they have two women on a board. <laughs> Sometimes they have one woman on a board. What happens when they get together? <laughs> <laughs> they had a very enlightened uh, CEO who I actually met um, at the Aspen Institute um, at one of their seminars. Um, and we first became friends and got to know each other. And eventually he called and he said, I have a seat open on my board, are you interested? Um, so that was pretty phenomenal uh, in 1997 to be the third woman on that board. Um, nowadays, um, three women is uh, thought of as kind of a, the minimum magic number, uh, so that um, so that women start making more more of a difference. So you're seeing certainly many of the larger um, companies uh, that uh, have gotten to that point three, and I'm on an A board that has four women. I think I was on one that had five women, actually. <laughs> um, in terms of the work world, um, I, things have most assuredly evolved, um, but uh, quite frankly, I have been uh, a bit, uh, astonished, shall we say, in recent years. I spent a lot of time traveling outside of the country doing business um, for various companies. Um, when I was in banking, when I was running international finance at Fannie Mae, when I was on the IMF board. Uh, so I wasn't quite as attuned uh, to what was happening in corporate America. But as I started uh, talking more, I spent more time in the country, talked more with younger folk, uh, many of whom I mentor about some of the experiences that they're having. I said uh, some of the, the negative experiences, shall we say, because they're a woman or because they are of color. Uh, I said, you, that, that can't be right. Those things were happening way back, you know, when I was in the corporate world, they can't still be happening. And they said, Mary, yes, they are. But the good thing is that it's all changing. Um, Companies are many, many companies, as you know, are much uh, more forthcoming about diversity, equity, and inclusion, about women, about people of color. Uh, people are really stepping out. And part of what's driving it um, are the, the, the younger generation, um, because um, uh, the younger generations, I think, are more outspoken. They are in many ways more demanding of uh, things that um, connote fairness and inclusiveness. And this is driving part of the change. And I think it's a wonderful thing. Oh, thank you, Mary. Well, Perry, I, I just want you to comment on that. There, there is so much hope. And, you know, your generation, we, we do look at you know, that that change is happening. How do you think about, you know, is this is this an expectation where you, you don't expect there to be bias because of your age or because you're a woman? Or do you expect there to be bias? Just curious as you're, as you're you know, sure. fresh eyed somewhat, not quite, but fresher eyed. Um, you know, how, how do you look at this? Yeah, I think you're right in saying that there's an expectation that there should not be any bias. Now, is that a reality? I think in some places it is, and in other places it's heading in that direction. Now that's not to say we're there yet. I think there's still a lot of work to do, but I think growing up through you know, college and in graduate school, I felt very supported by all of my male colleagues. I think that's true here at Bloom. I think in terms of diversity, I think Bloom has done a good job of choosing 
a more diverse workforce. And I hope that other companies are doing the same. But I think the, the main thing and what Mary touched on was that being vocal about things. So say if it's unfair, stating that it's unfair and bringing that to light is important because if you never say anything, oftentimes it's gonna go unnoticed. So I think while we're headed in the right direction, we can still do better. And hopefully maybe in 20 years, there really won't be any bias. But in order to have that, I think you need women to be in higher roles within industry. A lot of women exit industry as they get older, as they have families. There still is some societal pressure, I think, for women to be the caregivers. And the reality is not all women are good caregivers and maybe they don't wanna be caregivers and that should be fine. I think that you should be empowered to do whatever you want with your life because it's the only one you've got. So you should be leading it the way you wish. Absolutely, thank you, Perry. And you know what? Don't change those expectations, accept only equality and speak out, stay strong. And, you, and by the way, Susan and I and Mary have your back. <laughs> All right, Susan, um, you know what? I just, we have to hear some stories because not only did you, were you raised in the situation you were and you're one tough cookie, but you spent years in automotive. And I think that's a bit of a dog eat dog world, not to mention, we know there weren't a lot of Susans. So what stories can you share of what you've experienced that just might kind of highlight um, what some of the past look like as well as hope for the future. Well, many of the, uh, many of the stories I cannot share on Facebook Live. Um, Darn it. So what I, what I would say is, you know, and, and some of the things, um, so when I started, and I think, you know, the younger generation won't get this at all, but Others of, of others of you might every, every toolbox and every factory had a Playboy centerfold when you often, you know, you open the top of the craftsman toolbox. Um, so you'd be sitting there talking to a repairman about a car with it, you know, a naked woman looking at you. You know, all, all of the calendars had, you know, all the snap on calendars were were like that. And uh, um, uh, honestly, a lot of business got done in strip joints. So when I went into the workplace, I, and, and it's, I think it's, um, I, I, I give a lot of credit to my grandmother who's similar to uh, Mary's story. My grandmother could have been a judge, she could have been a lawyer, but she grew up poor and, uh, you know, in, in the beginning of the 20th century. And that just wasn't, wasn't in the path, but she was a ferocious reader. She, she read everything. She took me to Washington D.C. on a bus with a bunch of you know people her age in this in the in the in the 70s so that I could see the Capitol and you know I had a copy of the Constitution. I mean she was she was really really um, powerful around uh, around education. So I had a sense of myself and I had a sense of right and wrong. And I witnessed what happened. A lot of women went into the workforce and became men. You know, I mean, I have I have promised not to swear on Facebook Live. I'll, I'll do my best, but uh, um, and I decided that wasn't who I was. You know, it, I just I was not going to do that. I was not going to go to places I was uncomfortable. I was not ever going to ask because I believe me, a lot of the people who ended up in those places were as uncomfortable as I was, but they didn't they didn't see a way out of it. Um, I never smoked cigars. You know, I just I just I was who I was. Um, I wore color in the, in the workplace. I wore earring, you know, I was wore safety, you know, my clothes were always safe, but you know, I didn't, I didn't conform to the norm at the time. And I certainly don't judge the women that did. Um, but it was just something I chose not to do. And it slowed my career, um, in some ways, and it accelerated my career in others. I and mean, one advantage to being the only one that looks like you in the room is everybody remembers you. So if you're in the room, with a hundred people. And then, and yeah, when I was younger, I had really beautiful red hair. So, I mean, I, I, I stuck out doubly. Um, so, um, you know, I was who I was. I had a, a sense of who I was. I stood by, I stood by my ground and I stood by my values um, that were, were important to me. And the most important thing that happened to me is the guys on the production floor who basically told me, I'm not gonna work for you because you're a woman. You know, what are you doing here? 
we don't want you here became my strongest allies. And the, the, the people who built the cars, you know, the people who welded the cars and put the parts on the cars and, um, and they would say, this is happening and you need to know about this. And the, the, we, we had the two brake repairmen in the, in the first Ford factory that I started in. And uh, they had a toolbox and their toolbox had a bit of honey and uh, Mary Jane's. And back then I could eat all that, you know, cause you're on, your, on concrete for 12 hours. Um, and so I would go sit with them at their picnic table they would feed me candy, tell me everything that was going on. So then I, I was all of a sudden the smartest person in the room because I knew, I knew everything. And uh, so I, I, I think the, the moral of the story is always be true to yourself, hold to your values, and the people that rise up to support you are the right people. Thank you, Susan. Mary, you, over the course of, of, of time, there has you know, you persevered and you were successful from an early age. So regardless of what real bias or perceived bias there may have been, you rose above that. Tell us a little bit about what you think helped you do that uh, and, you know, what your experience had been and you know, just share with us maybe some insights into your success. Well, um, I, I think, um, Part of it is, is what uh, Susan has just talked about. Uh, one of my favorite songs is I Did It My Way. Um, and my way uh, was very much Susan's way, always being true to myself, always sticking to my values, uh, knowing that I had it, no matter what anybody else thought or said, Part of what I had to do uh, during the time that I came up in the business world, I've said this to many people, is, you know, today, um, young folk in the business world are able to speak out and um, able to demand certain things. We simply weren't able. I mean, it just wasn't going to work if you wanted to stay where you were and keep moving up. So part of what I had to do, I call it putting on blinders. And, um, and what that really means is, yes, I was aware of um, people who didn't want me there, uh, people who had doubts um, about uh, my abilities. And I had to basically ignore it and keep moving forward. And that served me extraordinarily well, because one of the things that I learned is that um, people are pretty similar also to Susan. You know, they have their doubts. Um, they don't like the fact that you're a woman. They don't like the fact that you're of color. But when you perform and when you bring in business and when you contribute to the bottom line, they don't see color anymore. They don't see gender anymore. <laughs> They just see somebody who can make the business better, and it works. And I have, um, I have uh, been supported, um, as Susan has, uh, by many, many men in the business world. I was told um, when I uh, was at the Bankers Trust Company, that was my most senior uh, banking job, um, that my boss, um, who was kind of a crotchety old Rhode Islander, <laughs> I was told that he was racist, that there was no way I could make it under him. Uh, this man was so supportive of me. Let me tell you one thing that happened uh, one day when I started uh, working for him and I had Fortune 500 companies um, as my clients. He went with me initially on most of the first calls to introduce me. Um, and to say that I was the new uh, relationship manager. And uh, when he stopped going on the calls and it was time for me to really get out there on my own, he saw me kind of holding back and being there at my desk too much. So he called me into his office because he could read you know, what was going on. And he said, what he said to me was, Bush, go on out there and do it. And if you fall on your face, we're here to pick you up. And that was just 
I mean, it touched my heart. It touched my mind, my confidence and everything. So after that, I was out there and I was doing it. (laughs) And and I'm proud to say did uh, some of the deals that put the Bankers Trust Company on the map in terms of being an investment bank. Uh, So some of the people who uh, seem that like they could be detractors or not want you there where you are can turn out to be some of your best friends and best supporters. Well, it's such a great life lesson. I think about my career and some of the men that have supported me and believed in me, they gave me confidence. They saw things in myself even before I saw them. Yes. And I do think that's extraordinarily powerful. And I believe, Perry, you've had a similar experience. You've had a male mentor. Tell us about that. Yeah, so uh, starting off in college, I was a work-study student um, to help pay for tuition. And in your freshman year, you're really not capable of doing any research because you just don't know enough about really any science to be an effective researcher. So I needed a work-study job, but I didn't have any experience. That being said, I asked the head of our chemistry department if there was any job I could do just so that I could get my foot in the door and start learning more about chemistry and become an integral part of the department. Um, Since I wasn't qualified for any research work, he was kind enough to let me clean lab benches, which I then did with another student. And I did that for the whole year. So I was able to get work study money to help pay for college while I was still interfacing with the chemistry department. Now, cleaning lab benches isn't exactly teaching you about chemistry, but forging that relationship enabled me to have a research position that following summer, which is really rare actually to be able to do academic research in college right after your freshman year. So that kickstarted my career. And then as a result of that, I was able to go to Brazil the following summer to do research. Uh, It was an amazing experience. I think, you know, science is a global uh, industry. And so being able to get those experiences outside of the country is very important. And looking back now, as I was moving through and then going into my PhD, men have always been supporting me in science. Uh, That was true as uh, a PhD student. My advisor is male, uh, Dr. David Glick always extremely supportive of us doing any engagement, making sure that anything we need, we ask for, and even prompting us to ask for it when we didn't need it, which I think can be an important thing to remember. Uh, Everyone says, we'll just ask for it. But sometimes it can be hard to ask for help. And I think that it's easy to think, oh, well, if you had just asked, well, people will lift you up. Sometimes you need someone to recognize that you need to be lifted up. And I think that I've had mentors who have largely been male that have done that for me and I've appreciated that, so. That's fantastic. I think we do share that, that there are times where we, we do need to ask and you know put ourselves out there. And sometimes we all just need someone to kind of pull us up and nudge us a bit and believe in ourselves. Let's maybe turn to a bit of that topic, you know, what what can we do and what have we done, um, you know, to really make a difference. And so I'll start with you, Susan, Um, you know, from the beginning of this, it's clear and it's been clear to me from the get go that you invest a huge amount of time mentoring, coaching and caring about other women in the workplace. So what are your, you know, what do you think the most important things are that the audience, you know, those of us on the panel, what, what do you think is the most important things that we can do to help? I would say that if, if, if you only have one activity that you can engage in, I would call it being a, being a sponsor. What I have found over the years and what I believe is the process that drives the most change is when you put your hands on someone personally, give them time for mentoring, give them training, give them access. But I would say if I had any regrets from my career, I saw the women before me work so hard to get to the table that when I got to the table, I didn't ask for enough. I asked 
for things, but I did not, I mean, I was use a football analogy, went to the 10 yard line. I should have gone, you know, moved the ball to the 40 mm -hmm. or something. So what I see um, as my role as a leader at Bloom, as a leader in girls in STEM is, is to be that sponsor. So whether it's, it's an eighth grade girl, um, you know, the science says that if a girl loses interest in STEM in middle school, it'll never come back. And I saw that I used to uh, sponsor robotics teams when I was at, at Nissan and the middle school teams would beat the high school teams because the problems that the robotics coaches had was they could get 100 kids in middle school to sign up for robotics. They could only get 10 kids to sign up for high school. If they hadn't done it in middle school, they weren't going to go to high school. And it was such a impactful, I mean, I, I could just see it live. And, and, uh, mm -hmm. and so I'm very passionate about sponsoring middle school girls and then, and then sponsoring women in the workplace. If you are in the room and if you are at the table, I believe um, that you owe it to the people before you and, and to the generations coming after you to sponsor, to speak up, to, to, have, to, to have the conversation. And, you know, I, I was at many conversations early in my career when people would say, oh, she won't take that job because she has kids. I'm like, ask her, make her turn it down. And so if I hadn't been in the room, the decision would have never been made to ask the woman if she wanted the job because the job would have been turned down for her without her even knowing it was available. Mm -hmm. so, so I think it's sponsor, 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 be in the room, but be present in the room and, and be very, um, yeah, I don't want to say aggressive, but, but be very very mindful of the role you play when you are a woman at the table um, and, and, and for all those women around you who, who you can help bring through the system. Yes, that's amazing. All right, uh, looking at the clock, we're gonna keep some time for questions and I'll be reviewing questions over the chat window. So please get your question ready. Um, if not, I think we have a lot to talk about, but would love to take your questions. So about a five minute warning on that. Um, uh, Mary, uh, as we look at what we can do, what has worked for you as far as mentoring or coaching others? And what do you recommend uh, we can do inside corporate America to make a difference? Hmm. Um, well, I, I think there is a lot uh, that corporate America can do. So let me talk about that first. Um, what, what I have seen um, work quite nicely in some companies is that a member of the executive team or somebody in senior management will very purposefully uh, take on a woman um, uh, as um as their mentee or the person that they will coach. Uh, I think it's very important uh, as women move more up the ladder in corporate America, that that happen, uh, that it be someone who's, um, who's very senior and um, that it not be just perfunctory, that they be very serious about it. You know, a lot of companies are, are going through a lot of cultural transformation with regard to these issues. Um, uh, many are very well-meaning, but you know, we hear about uh, subconscious bias uh, all the time. Mm -hmm. and, and it is there, um, but what I see, and it's of course mostly men who are in the executive or most senior positions, I, what I see is them trying um, to get uh, training, mind opening, eye opening, heart opening coaches themselves uh, to uh, make sure that they are, are have the right kind of openness in order to try to help bring a woman along. And, and you know, I'm thinking of some, some very specific circumstances where, where I see people um, just really making great transformations, the men uh, in order to mentor and coach uh, the women. So I think that's one very important thing uh, that um, corporate America can do. Uh, the um, ability for women to talk among themselves and then talk with senior management, you know, about issues. 
um, is also very important, however uh, that is organized. Uh, in terms of my own work, as I said, I do mentor, um, and, and it's mostly informal. Uh, many of these are the children of my friends, um, and these children are in some way in corporate America, and they're mostly from the 20s up to their, their 40, 40s. Uh, so I mentor uh, and coach them. Um, I am just about to take on mentoring um, uh, a mid-career woman formally uh, who is a board aspirant. Um, the, the, there's something called the Herndon Institute in Atlanta, which in association with NASDAQ is going to do an entire course um, for people of color and women on what it takes to be on a corporate board. Um, and I'm leading a part of that, the finance, the audit and technology uh, piece. I'm sorry, not technology. What am I saying? Risk, <laughs> technology, that's Susan's field. So uh, finance, audit and risk. Piece. Uh, but as a part of it, um, I'm taking on one of the, the, the Herndon fellows um, as uh, to, in a coaching type arrangement uh, for, for her aspirations as a board member. That's great. What, uh, what would you um, say, I go to you, Perry, on what would you want by way of program? Would you want a formal mentorship program? Um, I've been in this debate before, does mentoring work best? in a formal program or like what Mary mentioned, informal mentoring. Just curious, do you, do you feel supported and would a program like that work or do you would you just want an informal mentorship? I think it depends on the person. I think they both have merit. Uh, I think in an informal setting, you have a greater ability to interface one-on-one -on -one with the mentee and speak more candidly about some of the issues that you might not feel comfortable speaking about in a formal setting. So I think that that is important because if you're tiptoeing around issues, you're not gonna be able to solve them effectively. Whereas if you're speaking frankly, I think that's a faster route. Now that's not saying that, I think if you wanted to do a formal mentorship program, I think that's nice maybe in a larger setting. So maybe a group of women as opposed to a single mentee. Uh, that way you can all talk amongst yourselves and bounce ideas off one another. I think that would be really useful. Um, but for a personal yeah. mentorship, yeah, I think maybe an informal setting would be nicer. Yeah, I like that. I, I've had the, um, the opportunity to mentor it many times in my career. And one of the things that I really want out of a mentoring relationship is I want someone to know what they want. And then as a mentor, you can help chart their path. And oftentimes you're in a relationship like I need help. Well, what do you want to do? I don't know. Well, what would make you happy? I haven't thought about that. It's like, okay, well, you go do that. <laughs> and yeah. you know, I'll help you. So I, I do give the advice, like it's good to really be thoughtful and to, to have a vision and to know what will make you happy, what you're passionate about, where you're going, yeah. then you can really engage or activate a mentor or mentoring program to help you. But you have to start with yourself first. Sure. How would you help someone develop a vision? Like what, could you give us an example? Well, I think there, you know, for one, there's, there's a couple of really good books out there. Um, but I, I ask fundamental questions, which are, you know, where, you know, it starts with, where can you see yourself long term? When you've thought about what success looks like, paint me that picture. Uh, what makes you happy? What projects were you the most passionate about? What were you actually doing? You know, to kind of dig deeper into, yeah, actually, this is what and why. Why was it that project? Well, it was because there was a team and we were working collaboratively and you can really go off of that. So I think getting sure. in touch with what, what you want, it's harder than you think, but I think that's, <laughs> that's sure. the first. It does start with that. Okay, gotcha. well, guess what, panel? We're getting some meaty good questions here. So what I'm going to do um, <clears throat> is I'm going to read the question, and I'm going to let the panelist, you just give a good nod if you immediately are struck with an answer for this question, then I'll let the other panelists can chime in. How about that? Sounds good. So our first question came in, disproportionately high standards for women seeking promotion hurts us. 
but the flip side also hurts us. How do you think companies can break the habit of promoting male mediocrity and raise the bar for men closer to the level that's demanded for women? Good question. Well, I, I think the first thing in the, in the question, I think what you have to do when you're a leader, again, this is just my opinion, is you gotta get to the, to the baseline where you assume positive intent. And I don't think anybody promotes anybody who's mediocre intentionally. I mean, there are companies, I'm sure that happens, but I, I think that there is, a, there is a belief that this person is going to do something. Because if you're a leader like me, or you know, um, let's use the word manager, I have very, very stringent KPIs, OKRs, whatever you want to call them. I have deliverables I have to get. So I'm not going to promote a bunch of people I don't think can get me there. So I think what you, what, what you have to go back and say is, if you're seeing this in the, in the workplace, how do you have that conversation with your boss from the other side? Instead of saying, you know, this, is, this person is mediocre. These are the skills I bring. These are the talents I bring. This is how I can help you make your objectives. And it, you know, if you go back to the opening, Sherilyn, you talked about science. And there are scientific, I'll call them norms, I don't call them facts because I don't know if they're facts, but they're scientific norms, you know, like attracts like, all, the, all, those, all those kind of things. And, 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 and people, um, people are attracted to who they know and, and maybe who they look like, right? Um, so, so you have to have the, the conversation where you can, where you can bring, what is it that you bring that's different? And generally, if you go to someone, or at least this has worked in my, in my career, I got promoted very fast because I was able to solve problems no one else could solve. Now, does that mean the standards were higher for me? Absolutely. I mean, I had to work three times as hard as everybody else to get where I am. It just is what it is, you know? That's, that was, you know, that's the, the culture and the environment that I came up in. You know, I have had kids. I've, you know, you know, I've made sacrifices. I would not say, you know, that, that I've had work-life balance and not everybody wants my life. But I do think it's really important for us as leaders to, to constantly be challenged. You know, we got to challenge ourselves. But if you're on the other side of that equation, go to, you know, continue to bring up what it is you bring what you will do differently, how you can drive the business, how you can drive the metrics. Um, and, and this gets back to kind of the, the things that I didn't do earlier in my career that I, that I wish I had done. I wish I had represented myself better. Um, and honestly, I wish I hadn't worked as hard because um, a, lot of, a lot of that extra work wasn't, wasn't necessary and didn't necessarily help me, help me get where I was. What helped me get where I was um, is taking on, you know, you can call it the glass cliff. I think that that's a, a great term. You know, I remember when Mary Barra got the, the uh, job at GM, everybody thought she was going to fail because GM was a mess. And look what she's done. Now she's raised the bar. She set the standard. There are more women in automotive today. So sometimes you got to take on the glass cliff um, to get where you want to go. And I think that is the more of us that have the courage to take on the glass, glass cliffs, then we can, we can open the the, the road for uh, for more and more women to get in. So that's that's my opinion. The the the, the person who asked the question may not agree with me, but that's that's my experience. Well, Susan, I, I you said something that resonated with me, and I also believe is we can be equally quick to rush to judgment um, and to think we see a full view of a situation of say another colleague, but seek information. You know, to check your own assumptions. You know, it, it, you know is you know, do your peers do, does your manager, what do they see in you to get that picture? You might get really interesting feedback and you might end up finding out that maybe either the, 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 the person that did get promoted, you didn't understand, maybe there's something you're missing. Maybe there's an opportunity that this opens the door to have the conversation where you can promote yourself, which is important, which is, I would have loved this opportunity. I, you know, I really do believe I was good at A, B, and C. Could you help me understand why I wasn't considered? Those are really healthy conversations. So you use it as a door opening. All right, well, we'll, we'll, we'll get into a couple other questions. Um, Gary, do you wanna say something? 
Oh, yeah, I think I just the Perry. That's okay. I wasn't sure. I was like, should I raise my <laughs> hand? Be lucky. The Q&A window, but I'm blocking Perry. <laughs> oh, sorry. No, no, I, I didn't want to interrupt. Um, I think two things for that question. One, as a company, I think talking about unconscious bias, that's something that the company teaching their employees how to look for that, how to address that. I think that's the best thing the company can do for those sorts of situations. But from a personal standpoint, as the woman in that position, I think the best thing you can do is get comfortable with asking for things that you need and things that you want. Like Sherilyn was saying, you need to be able to have those frank discussions. And I think it's pretty uncomfortable personally. I don't like asking for things. I would much rather have someone approach me and say, hey, we think you deserve this. Let me be upfront and saying, no, I want this. I want to be going forward in this direction. But the moment you can get comfortable with asking those hard questions, I think that's the moment you're ready to succeed. Yes, and statistically, men are better at that than we are. That's true. Mary, any comment on that question? Mary, you're on mute. Oh, we lost you. Yeah, I think she got. I, my <laughs> yeah, I, I fully agree that uh, women do need to get better, better at asking for things. Men do a great job at that, and women need to move forward with that. Yeah. Knowledge is power, too. All right, we have a good next question. Uh, how do you deal with gender bias when it comes from a male dominated upper management? in maybe a company where there isn't the infrastructure set up with formal HR, you know, ways that you can go around that, you know, how do you deal with that? Any reaction? Yeah, I think that's a good opportunity to flex your male friendships, right? We're talking about having male allies. A lot of men want to see women succeed. And there are probably plenty of men at your company that want to see you, if you're doing a great job in your role, move forward and help the company because ultimately everyone wants to make money. So I think flexing that friendship is the best thing you can do in that situation if you don't have other peers that are women to help you out. And even if you do have peers that are women. And I, I think if I heard you say the question, Sarah Linda said something about going around HR. I don't think it's good to, to go around the policies and procedures you may want to go have a discussion with the HR team, um, and you know, and bring your perspective. But I would never now whether they agree with you or not. To hold, you know, it could be a whole different situation. But I would never go around them. And I'm not sure if I heard that or not. In the question. I think the question is if you know, what do you do in a situation where you don't have a formal HR platform or program to use? So. How do you deal with it if maybe in a smaller company you don't have? Yeah. In a smaller company, I would, it's definitely, you know, you, you need to talk to your boss in a healthy way. And, yep. and you know, there's, there's some courage involved in all of this. Believe me, I, I, I'm not going to speak for, for anyone else on this panel, but, you know, I wouldn't be where I was if I didn't have courage. And, and the advantage of growing up without uh, a lot was, you know, kind of my philosophy was, well, what's worse that I can happen, you know? I could be poor, well, I've been there, done that. So I think, I think you've got to know what are you, how far are you willing to go for you to advocate for yourself? Set those boundaries and then, and then go for it. And if you're not okay with it, just be okay with not being okay with it. I, I completely agree. There is, you know, I call that the power of choice and we all have choices of the environments we put ourselves in and how we respond to things. And, you know, there, there is a moment in time where if you're in that kind of situation, I loved Perry's suggestion, go to your peers, seek sponsorship from your peers. I've had peers actually be the ones going, Sherilyn should have that job. Um, so that can be very effective. You know, Susan, you're saying have courage, speak to the boss. Um, if all else fails, we have the power of choice and you know, no one um, is forced to stay in a certain situation. So we always, there's always that alternative as well. Caroline, I would, I would just add, if I may, yeah, it's very, very important um, uh, that people not necessarily assume that there is gender bias. Maybe there yeah. is. But also, um, even if you do assume it, you don't have to base your conversation on that. What you can base your conversation on 
is or your own um, uh, your own capabilities, expertise, accomplishments, and um, and then raise the question: uh, Why am I not being considered for such and such, or would like to be considered for such and such? I think that is that's spot on. There is so much in the 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 approach yes. completely can change the outcome. That's and right. I, I think you're right. Be planning. And our last question had, you know, as we're wrapping up, was you know how do you plan the conversation? How do you ask for a mentor? You know, I I do think being prepared and you know putting yourself on the other side and thinking through what it is that you're really looking for and being specific, but not rushing to judgment and give benefit of the doubt. I think that's also what Susan said is give benefit of the doubt and don't, don't assume you know, bad intention, assume good intention and start there because most of the time people are well-intentioned. Um, so let's part with just a closing comment. Um, maybe in one or two words, what would you want to share with women um, as far as you know, we're pearls of wisdom um, I would say, you know, I would say seek mentorship and, and build a network. Um, I'll go, I'm going to go to you last, Mary. I'll go to you next, Perry. All right. Uh, I would say seize the opportunities given to you. It's the best thing you can do. Perfect. Susan? Yeah, I, I would say get a sponsor, find someone who's going to be in the room for you, but also will give you very direct and, uh, and, and powerful feedback. And be in the room when it happens, and when uh, when 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 something is said, you know, have the courage to to stand up and, and speak your piece. Oh, sage wisdom, thank you. And the Honorable Mary Bush, please close us out. I would say, seek excellence. Always perform uh, to the best of your abilities. And I firmly believe that those opportunities will come, or you'll be able to seize them when you see them appearing. Wonderful. Thank you very much. That was really fun. I appreciate it. And I hope our audience enjoyed it as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Sherilyn. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Sherilyn, for co uh, hosting. You're welcome.